I can say with certainty that is the last time my name is going to be on the same marquee as <laughs> your names. Also, not a Nobel Prize winner, just in case. That's me. Um, so this is called Seven Days of Genius. And when the word genius was mentioned, I was backstage with all of you guys, and there was a lot of eye rolling and chuckling. But like it or not, you are considered geniuses, <laughs> so take it. Um, I want to start with a broad question because you are considered geniuses of the field, in the field of economics. Um, and I, and I, this is sort of a philosophical question as much as, as it is anything else. Um, you're considered geniuses, but when we talk about the most disruptive thing that happened, uh, economically speaking, globally, we talk about the years 2007 and 2008. And yet many economists failed to predict that disruptive moment in the United States and, and globally. But both Paul and I did. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying right. to, and that's why you're the genius. <laughs> and, and I guess, and, 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 and to that point, I wonder if you think the field of economics on whole is better at reinterpreting the events of the past than it is looking towards the future. I'll start with you, Yeah, Paul. so I actually, so no, I didn't predict it. I mean, I, I, I thought something bad would happen, but nothing remotely on this scale, right? So the housing bubble, thought it would be ugly, but you know, the, the scale of the ugliness came as a, as a, a shock to, to me, as, as uh, to almost everyone. Um, but I actually think, let me say that the, the crisis itself, the, the financial crisis, we didn't, you know, hardly, you know, some people saw it coming, but they also saw five crises that didn't happen coming, so it doesn't quite count. <laughs> uh, but in a way, that's, that, that is to some extent excusable because the world is a complicated place. And there's always going to be something out there that you missed, and that's typically where really drastic events come from. What's not much known is that actually since those crisis days, uh, a lot of basic economics has worked remarkably well. I mean, so, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't see uh, the crisis coming, but I and many others said, look, all these people telling you that the Fed's printing money is going to cause runaway inflation, that interest rates are going to soar because of those budget deficits, not so. Look at the situation we're in. It's not going to work. And in fact, it's worked beautifully. It's, I, I've, one of the things I sometimes say is I, I've spent my life not entirely sure whether I was a fraud or not. <laughs> because... You know, I knew I was good at publishing papers. I think papers. the jury's in on that one. No, but Paul. that was interesting. I was only in the last six or so years that I'd say, oh, hey, you know, <laughs> right. the stuff works. Uh, we've been actually pretty good on, on a lot of these issues these past six. So, so that's actually, now, the, the sad thing is that half, half the economics profession has thrown away um, things that we know work largely for ideological reasons. So the real sin, from my point of view, is not the failure to predict the crisis, it's the insistence on clinging to doctrines that are just obviously not working for the six years that have followed the crisis. Professor Stiglitz? Well, I think in the terms of that, I think one of the things is that uh, I think the economy's recovery has not been particularly good, and that I think it was pretty clear that you could not just rely on monetary policy. Right. That it, it helped a little bit. I think Paul was right that the fears that all that uh, increase of printing of money, whatever you call it, would be inflationary were absurd. And that's been proven right. But also it's true that, that there were economists who thought that monetary policy would do the trick. Right. And who thought that, you know, the way I put it, that putting the banks in the hospital for a year and a half, giving them not a blood transfusion, but a couple trillion dollars of money would make them feel happier. And that would get the economy working again. It's clear that that was wrong, that you needed real fiscal policy, you needed real stimulus, and that in a fundamental sense, the economy was broken in some, before the crisis. It was using a bubble to keep it going. And that's what we should have recognized and, and was not by most members of the economics profession and by the administration. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, for, let, let me first apologize that my uh, English uh, sounds a lot like French and let me... <laughs> Let me also mention that it's 2 a.m. in Paris, and so if I, if I, <laughs> if I seem a bit a slow, there, there are reasons for this. But, you know, I, I think there's a lot of ideology in the economic uh, profession, and I think, you know, many economists uh, 
have a view of markets which is not only uh, idealistic and naive, but uh, you know, they are defending uh, the, the view that markets are working efficiently, are working well, for ideological reason also, you know, I think economists spend a lot of time sometimes uh, uh, doing uh, complicated uh, mathematical models, uh, 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 trying to pretend that markets are efficient. But they do that also to try to impress others in other disciplines to look more scientific. I am not sure. No, this is, this I, is not a joke. I, I am not sure this is... A, you know, I'm not sure this is working, but this is certainly part of their strategy. So, you know, I think we should be very modest. You know, I, I view myself more as a social scientist than as an economist. I think the frontiers between economics, uh, history, sociology are not as clear as what economists try to pretend. You know, economists try to pretend that sometimes they have developed a science that is so sophisticated that the rest of the world uh, cannot understand, but I think this is a joke. You know, I think what I, what, the reason I was attracted in this field is because I think the, you know, we start from very low, from very little, so at least there is room to make progress, but we, we have to recognize that, you know, we, we, you know, we, all we can do, uh, you know, I, do, I don't believe in genius, you know, I think we, I, we, 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 our only advantage as compared to, to other people is that we are paid to, <laughs> collect uh, data and to try to understand the theoretical mechanism or models that can account for this data. And, you know, we have to be modest and try to make this, uh, this you know, little progress if we want to be uh, uh, useful. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's not always clear that, that economists are, are so useful. <laughs> yeah. We put too much stock in economists, perhaps. <laughs> let, but let me ask you, as someone who's observing society holistically, perhaps not discreetly mathematically, in terms of your social scientist cap, Europe, and I'll ask you guys this vis-a-vis -vis America, where do you see Europe in 20 years, given the, the, the sort of upheaval that the EU is facing at this moment? Okay, well, that's a difficult question. I, you know, uh, right now the situation in Europe and particularly in the Eurozone is very bad. So the main, the main problem with the inequality today in Europe is really unemployment, youth unemployment. So the level of youth unemployment, uh, you know, in Southern Europe, but also in France, is extremely large. So when you have, uh, you know, 20%, sometimes 25, 30% of the young generation who start their life with no professional experience, you know, this is, this is a terrible uh, situation. And I think the, the basic problem is that the, you know, the Eurozone is not working. The, uh, you know, I, I think it's possible to make it work, but a single currency with 18 different public debt, 18 different interest rates on which financial markets can speculate, 18 different uh, tax system in competition with one another, this is a system that does not work and that will So do you will, think the Eurozone is untenable? So, no, I think what we need, you know, you cannot have a single currency without a government. So what I, I think we will need is a, a Eurozone parliament that will vote a budget, that will have, for instance, a common corporate tax. You know, there was a recent scandal in Europe with the, the so-called Luxembourg leaks scandal where, uh, you know, uh, uh, many uh, uh, international, multinational corporations from the U.S., but also from Europe, you know, appear to be paying uh, almost no corporate tax at all uh, by, uh, uh, you know, putting their, uh, their accounts basically in Luxembourg. And so we had uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, who is uh, president of the European Commission, who came to the European media and said, well, you know, uh, uh, this is not, this was not my fault, you know, I was at the head of Luxembourg and, you know, I had to find a development strategy for my country and uh, <laughs> there was desindustrialization, so I had to find something else and, and my idea was to become a tax haven, basically, to tax <laughs> Yes. <them. laughs> And, and, you know, this was amazing, you know, because every country in Europe has a problem with desindustrialization, and so if we all just steal the tax base of each other, yeah. you know, we are not going to go very far. And so I, I think here, the, as long as we have unanimity rule to decide for taxation, and in particular corporate taxation in, in Europe, you know, we will be in this situation where we, we reduce the tax burden on large corporations, high income, high wealth individuals, and we overtax low-skilled labor, 
medium skill labor that cannot move, and that's bad for job creation, that's bad for unemployment, and that's yeah. part of the reason. So, you know, I think there are ways to fix this, but, but with the current European institutions, which are based on a, a unanimity rule, for fiscal decision and which are based on uh, 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 automatic rules for deficit reduction with too much austerity. There was an attempt to reduce the public deficit that was too fast yeah. and that has killed growth. So we have to, we need a more democratic governance of Europe. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's important that, uh, uh, you know, uh, France and Italy do not just complain about Germany all the time, which is uh, one <laughs> of the... And, and, and make concrete proposals yeah. to change the European treaties and the European institutions. And if we do that, then in 20 years, maybe Baby. Europe will be in a good situation. Otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm not so optimistic if we don't change the existing European institutions. So I would pose that question, I mean, and obviously feel free to weigh in on Europe to the degree that you want to, but where do you see the United States in 20 years, or what do you see in the next 20 years? Well, uh, first let me say, the, the, uh, I'm, uh, in general, like most economists, fairly pessimistic about the world, <laughs> and the only thing that makes me feel good about America is that things could be worse. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when... Well... <laughs> <laughs> There, there's an old line about, along those lines that said, so, you know, a voice came to me and said, cheer up, things could be worse. So I cheered up, and sure enough, things got worse. Anyway. <laughs> Sliding that, scale of expectations, yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, this is not just, you know, where we're talking where we're going, say, on the issue of inequality. This is not just, just like the issues in Europe, are not just economic issues. I mean, I think if, if we were running Europe, we would know how to get it out of its pro troubles. We would know what policies and what... Uh, changes in the structure would be required, and the same thing. If if we're left to Paul and me, I think <laughs> in the United States, I think we would be able to, you know, reduce the level of inequality. We're not geniuses; we're philosopher king. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, no. Anyway, so I I think we could. The real question is is so it's, you're asking a little bit about a political crystal ball. And economist crystal ball, as you point out, was very cloudy, and a political crystal ball was really, really cloudy. But what I yeah. say, say is that if we don't change some of the fundamental policies that we've had in place and some the way, I, I can see our inequality getting much worse in the United States. Well, and Paul, you write about the yeah. political system as well. Yeah. I mean, given what we have right now and the trend lines we see with bifurcation and a partisan split, yeah, I mean, so um, so my version of what Joe was going to say is, I, I I say you know it's been kind of a race between us and 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 Europe to see who can who can <laughs> screw up worse. And uh, at the moment, Europe is winning, but it's uh, um, but but not by. And uh, actually, one thing I want to say is, I think that that the European problem, it, there is a, a huge structural problem, which is that it you, you have a single currency without a single government, and that is a that is a that is a, a fundamental thing. But there are also it's exacerbated by, um, by bad economic doctrines. And it's exacerbated by, uh, there's a, a lot of what I would, I'm making this up on the spot, fiscal hypochondria in Europe. There's, there's this, uh, this tendency to, to assume that, that you're broke and you're busted and you're failing even when you aren't, uh, case in point being France. Here we have a government that thinks it has, a, it has a deficit crisis, thinks it has a debt crisis, thinks that its economy is failing. Um, it can borrow 10 year, at 0.6% interest rates. Uh, that doesn't look like a fiscal crisis. If you look at, at the employment record, it's actually, um, it's actually not bad. If you actually look at prime age workers, if you're, if you're a person in that 25 to, to 55 age range, you're more likely to be employed in France than you are in the United States. So you have this, and yet the French have managed to become convinced that they're in this desperate strait, and they, and they do things that make it worse. So Don't we, and just, are, aren't we here to convince? I mean, well, we, the, we the narrative goes bit on in, in, in certain sectors of our political discourse oh, no, that the, things are terrible and we've been run off the rails. Oh, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the bowl of Simpsonism was our version <laughs> of it, but, but the fact of the matter is we at least had some significant pushback uh, on that, and, and it didn't go so far. Um, what I would say about America is we have, um, we have a lot of advantages. I mean, the American society is flexible, it's, it's accommodating, uh, we get you know, tremendous ability to, to uh, accept 
uh, talent from around the world, uh, uh, just a general level of, of I think, of, of intellectual flexibility in many ways. And then we have uh, half of our political system is completely, is stark raving mad. Um, and because Not of, saying which side, which half. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because, I, because as a Times columnist, I can't do endorsements. You have right, no idea right, what I support. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and because of our constitutional structure, um, it, it's actually possible for, uh, for that, for that ev even in the best of circumstances, that effectively blockades lots of action. You know, God help us if, if the financial crisis struck again. Uh, try to imagine, you know, uh, putting together even the very flawed rescue of, of the financial system and all of that. What would we do now? If things went really wrong, uh, you know, we'd have people saying that the solution is to close the border with Mexico or something. I mean, it would just be... Uh, <laughs> They may yeah. still say that yet. Yeah, but can I, can I just pick up one point, which is <clears throat> one of the problems is focusing on the wrong problem. Well, so that in the case of the United States, we focused on too much debt, and that's also been a problem in, in, in Europe. The real problem uh, is that the fruits of our growth have not been widely shared. So if you look at the middle, median income is lower in the United States than it was 25 years ago. Median income of a full-time male workers lower than it was 40 years ago. Those are real problems. And unfortunately, that's not where uh, the discourse is. Well, and I, I, that gets us to another sort of other mitigating factors here. I mean, the reason there's a sort of misguided focus on the debt has to do with one of the political parties being obsessively focused on that. It has to do with a media structure that talks about that incessantly. It has to do with folks that just want to hear what they want to hear in one sector. And I guess I wonder, you know, as we look onto the 21st century landscape where facts have become fungible as economists, how distressing is that to you? I mean, there are true debates about things we thought were settled. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it, um, there, there's a, I, I, I think it really, you know, we, we, it, it really is much, this is one of the questions, wasn't it always thus? And I think it wasn't. It used to be that there was an establishment and it would sort of settle on what a fact was, and, and sometimes wrongly, but, but at least there was, and it was persuadable because it was not that polarized. And now, sure, people, people know what they know and, and they have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's a funny thing because the, the availability of, of information is greater than ever before. It's possible. If you, if you are, want to learn about a subject and are willing to put in some effort and, and you know, have a little bit of a, I'm trying to find out a way to, to well, if you have, if you have a, just a bit of a bullshit detector, um, you, can, you can screen things out. And, 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 but on the other hand, the uh, ability to live in a cocoon of, of, uh, of false stuff. I mean, it, we actually have been following, uh, some people I know have been following on health care. If you look at, at the Affordable Care Act and how it's played out, um, if you have been watching Fox, every problem or rumor of a problem gets reported, and then, then when it goes away or it turns out it wasn't true, that never gets reported. So you have the feeling that this thing is a, is a disaster. In fact, what we probably have done at this point is we probably insured about 20 million people once in the second yeah. year's stuff, you know, and, and costs are well below. And so it's actually this great policy success, and half the country thinks it's been a disastrous failure. Do, do the French just have better bullshit detectors? I mean, when you hear this, <laughs> uh, when you hear this, well, you know, let, let, me, let me give you an outside viewpoint on inequality in the US. You know, I think I, I find it, from the outside, you know, it's very difficult to understand why a plan like the one uh, um, President Obama described a few weeks or months, a few weeks ago, is, is uh, you know, will apparently will never be adopted in, uh, in the US. You know, the, the view that you should ask a little more to the top groups that have done so well in recent decades in order to invest in the public education system and in particular in, uh, in uh, you know, for all those groups in the population who of course don't go to Harvard or to Princeton and who uh, you know, are accessing a quality of uh, higher education in community college in this country which is not let's say, as good as it should be. And if you, if you compare how much is invested, uh, you know, there, there are statistics that are really uh, striking uh, in, in this country and which are very difficult to understand from the uh, uh, viewpoint of the rest of the world. Uh, another example, you know, apart from investment in education, you know, you take the level of the minimum wage in this country 
uh, is less than what it was uh, yeah. in, the less, in the late 1960s, you know, 50 yeah. years ago. So, okay, so now it's 7.3 or 4 dollars at the federal level per hour. You know, it was 10 dollars if you put it in dollars of today in the late 1960s. So yeah. that's quite unusual, you know, in half a century <laughs> right. that a country has a lower minimum wage than what it used to have. Unemployment at that unusual time... Unusual is euphemistic. <laughs> <laughs> Unemployment at that time was, was actually the same as today or less than what it is today. So there was no more unemployment. So, and, and that's, you know, uh, when you look at it from the rest of the world, that's, that's, that's difficult to understand. So, so you, know, I, I, you know, I don't know, in, in Europe, uh, the, the problems that people are trying to solve are uh, in a way more complicated because making all nation states, uh, you know, disappear in a peaceful manner and create a new, bigger political community. You know, that's a complicated exercise, which, uh, which uh, you know, it's not working well, but that's a complicated exercise. I mean, here, in principle, the federal institutions exist, but they don't seem to be responding. They, they don't you know. seem to be functioning. They don't present. seem to be functioning. And so I've, I've not understood everything as to why the majority rule had become a super majority rule. And, and you know, I think right. the rest of the world is not understanding what's happening yeah. here in this country. But, but, but uh, you, you, you know, I, I You bring know. up a very good point about the minimum wage. And Walmart just raised its workers' wages. Yeah. They're going to go up to $10 an hour at some point um, in the near future. And I wonder, when you guys hear about that, were states taking the initiative to raise the minimum wage. Is that the new model? Are we sort of done? Are we, could we be done with the federal minimum wage? Uh, well, no, I mean, first, uh, let me say, one of the things that, that Walmart raising their, their wage to that level illustrates is the fact that it's not just market forces that are determining wages, that they have the power, the choice to raise their wages. Right. And so, in a way, it strengthens the argument that I've had, and I think all of us here have had, that there are a lot of non-market forces Pressures. determining what is going on. So, it's the same thing. You can't justify, you know, you're talking about the, the wage at the bottom. You talk about the CEO pay, mm -hmm. which has gone from being 30 times the average of the people who are working for them to over 300 times. Without any justification, you can't say they, they suddenly got more productive, they, their, their productivity increased 10 times faster th than the rest uh, of society. So, and, and what's interesting, and it highlights the, the political nature, in Dodd-Frank in 2010, we included, there, there was included a provision that companies would have to disclose this number. And They've been fighting, the corporation's been fighting this disclosure. So we're 2015, five years after Dodd-Frank, and the SEC, who's supposed to administer, write the regulations for the disclosure, is still hamstrung. So we got it through, and uh, through, it got through Congress, got signed, and then the, 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 the politics has made it impossible to actually get it. And indeed, provisions of Dodd-Frank are being <laughs> rolled right. back. And then there are provisions that are being rolled back, uh, um, like the one on the derivatives. And but I, I want to say a word about local action. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, as it turns out, um, there is a lot more scope for local increases in the minimum wage uh, than you might have expected. I mean, there's one, there's actually the, the evidence we have is, is overwhelmingly uh, economists who studied what happens when you know Jer New Jersey raises its, way, its minimum wage and Pennsylvania doesn't, and you would think there would have to be some loss of jobs, and we don't see it, which is telling you there's more room. On the other hand, it's got to be clear on that and everything else that it's a lot better if everybody does it at once. It's, it, there, it, there is presumably some payoff to an individual state from undercutting the wages of every other state, and yet that's, that's counterproductive for society as a whole. So you really, local action is not a substitute for federal action. However, um, it can be a stepping stone. And I guess I still hope for political redemption. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big reader <laughs> of the history of the, of the New Deal. And the history of the New Deal actually begins a long ways before the New Deal. It begins with New Deal type programs at the state level. You know, FDR didn't come out of nowhere. He came out of being governor of New York. He came out of Al Smith's New York. So that when we see these local initiatives that are spreading, they are good things in themselves, but they're also um, 
if you want what the optimistic story about what America is like 20 years from now, I think a lot of it, it involves things that start at the level of states and cities trying to do better by their workers, trying to do better by ordinary families, and, and that that eventually becomes the national norm. Yeah. Do you, okay. go ahead. I mean, that's the optimistic note. One, one of the striking things is when they do <laughs> polls, that oh. about 70%. That was the optimistic note, and. It, no, that oh, they sure. do polls. 70% of Americans believe there ought to be an increase right. of the minimum wage. And a majority of Republicans uh, but believe we should do it. And I mean, that's, I think that's, that's part of the, and, and I would love to get your thoughts on this. There are, there are issues upon which the vast majority of Americans agree, and our political system has proven incapable of moving the ball forward on any of them. Right. And in, in, in some part because our legislative branch appears to be broken, and some part because moneyed interests have a very, very big stake in our yeah. political process. And I... Do you think that it will just get better or there needs to be some kind of disruptive event to change the way we govern? Oh, I think it's going to get worse unless there's a <laughs> disruptive event. I mean, when you have things like uh, the Citizens United and, and right. those, those court decisions are giving more power to money. And so unless there, there is what you call a disruptive event, I, I don't see any, any force uh, pulling us back. And they say the one hopeful note are some issues, but a lot of them, you know, some issues can be addressed at the local level, minimum wage. But you can't address the issue, for instance, of, you know, one of the mysteries. Why should people at the top pay lower tax rates than people who, who are not at the, at the top? You know, it's not a question of saying we're, we're going to have a progressive tax that's going to take more from you. This is just saying you ought to pay at least the same rate. And except, I think it's a really peculiar provision of our, you know, of, of our, our tax system. Peculiar being euphemistic. <laughs> yeah. um, Tomas, I want to ask you, you know, we, we, to, the, to, the, to the, the notion that economics is a social science, um, we see a world in upheaval, not just economically, but socially, politically, and culturally. And we've been talking a lot in the news media about terrorism and, and ICE, the rise of ISIS, the rise of radicalized terrorists. And there are a number of factors that folks tend to point out as motivating factors in terms of radicalizing young men. Some of those factors are economic, that they feel disenfranchised, they're at the bottom, they feel hopeless. There's no, we have no sort of accuracy meter as far as whether that is actually the force. But when you hear about something like ISIS, or in Paris, Charlie Hebdo, and radical fundamental ideologies attracting those sort of at the bottom of society. Um, how, how do you process that? Well, it's clear that there are many different, uh, you know, cultural and social uh, economic forces that are playing a role. In the, you know, in the Middle East, the Middle East is probably the most unequal region in the world, you know, even more unequal than Latin America, because if you take the distribution of oil resources, and, uh, you know, in, in my book, at some point, I compare the, the total uh, budget uh, for education uh, in a country like Egypt, which is a country with 90 million inhabitants, almost 100 million inhabitants, and their total education budget is uh, 100 times smaller than the oil revenue uh, that uh, little countries with no inhabitant uh, in the Gulf regions are getting out of their oil revenue uh, just a few hundred kilometers away. And, and so that's a very unequal region, and, and the, the role that uh, uh, Western countries, European countries, and the US, of course, have had to protect this extremely unequal situation uh, you know, I think it has, has not been, uh, has not helped a lot to, uh, to put it this way. You know, I think we have contributed in a way to make this place, uh, uh, you know, very uh, place with a lot of tension. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that's the only reason, but right. that's, that's part, that's certainly part of the problem. And, you know, in the case of, the, of, uh, of Charlie Hebdo, you know, the two, the two young uh, uh, brothers, well, they were now, they were 30 year old when they, they went to Charlie Hebdo and killed everyone. You know, when they were 20 year old, Ten years ago, they, they wanted and they actually tried to go to Iraq in order to fight the American army. And they could not get there, but they tried. And now, you know, ten years later, they are, st they, they are still trying to make war, but in Paris and not in Iraq. And, and, uh, and uh, it's... Uh, 
So that's uh, that's part of the uh, you know of, of the of the story. I, I think the, the rise of nationalism and ethnic division is often a response to the failure to solve. Uh, domestic uh, uh, social and inequality problems. And, you know, I'm very concerned also in Europe with the rise of nationalism, the rise of populism. You know, in, in my country, uh, uh, there is a serious risk that the extreme right will win not the national election, but possibly some regional elections at the end of this year. So, you know, I think when you, when you cannot solve uh, uh, domestic social inequality problem in a peaceful manner, it's always tempting to blame others, you know, to blame right. foreign workers, to blame foreign countries, foreign culture, foreign religion. And, and uh, that's, that's, to me, that's the biggest danger with, uh, with rising inequality is that, uh, uh, you know, there, 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 there can be more and more social groups who prefer to turn for nationalist solution or, or radical solution. So, Professor Krugman, I would ask you, in, in terms of the nationalism in the United States, right, that, that, that perhaps that's rooted in institutional failure or an inability for, uh, that the, the system is not working for a group of people. What's weird to me is the people that are most, uh, you know, the, this sort of entrenched opposition to government programs, many of those people are the very same beneficiaries. Or the, the hatred for the Affordable Care Act, you know, there are plenty of people in red states who would benefit greatly by expanded uh, exchanges. Yeah, and uh, so there's a lot of discussion uh, in, in the... Uh, Sociological, political science literature. Boy, I'm sounding like a professor, aren't I? Anyway, the uh, uh, but of uh, the um, questions of false consciousness, and um, uh, clearly in the U.S., a lot of it, a lot of it is goes back to the original sin. It really is. It really is about race, and people don't. Uh, and it's, it's not clear that the public in these states actually understands that uh, that. That, it, that, that they may themselves actually, it may not be taking from them to give to those people, but it might actually be for them. Actually, it's what's interesting about the case before the Supreme Court right now, the, you know, the ludicrous but possibly successful attempt to use a, uh, a, a deliberate misreading of, of the act to, to uh, deny uh, the subsidies. It, the, the, the people who will be hurt would be overwhelmingly uh, older Southern whites because, because uh, the minority groups are are in, in uh, by and large being covered by Medicaid and the and the uh, and of course in, in the northern states we have state exchanges for the most part so so it's a, it's a, it, this is literally this is the the, the the conservative base directing you know carefully aiming a gun right at, at its own it's forehead a it's a, with it's people what, trying to pull the trigger right desperately so it, it's a uh, but um, but you know it, let me just say that it um, there's a lot of People's motives are complicated, and people's, uh, and we may dislike them. And, but and you might say, "Oh, look, that's stupid." But all right, people are, have complicated pride, sense of identity matters a lot. I mean, some of the political scientists I talk to point out that there's a remarkable phenomenon of um, affluent people in the Northeast who vote for higher taxes on themselves. Right. And they suggest, you know, there's a famous Thomas I mean, Frank. Is, there are people in this room that probably <laughs> yeah. do that. There's a. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I think my forthcoming job at CUNY is going to be largely about having dinner with us. Anyway, uh, um, but the, uh, uh, but someone said that, you know, Thomas Frank had a, a great, wonderfully written book called What's the Matter with Kansas, and saying that you probably should also have a book, What's the Matter with Connecticut, because of what, all of these affluent people who vote for higher taxes on themselves. But, but look, it's, uh, I, I think a lot of, it really is identity politics. That's what you, you really come down to. And, uh, I picked up a phrase from when the Bernie Madoff scandal uh, came. I learned a very useful phrase, which is affinity fraud, uh, which is yeah. that people are very easily conned by people who other people who they think of as being like themselves, as being part of their tribe. And affinity fraud is just rampant in American politics. Affinity yeah. fraud. Yeah. I hope everyone's writing that down and getting to tweet it's it and great. use it. It's so that's a powerful concept. Yeah. yeah. What I wanted to say is is. There are some aspects of inequality that are particularly uh, enervating, destructive, and, and lead to, to you know, say socially uh, adverse behavior. One of them is when you have uh, high levels of unemployment, particularly of youth, particularly of uh, males, uh, because if they can't use their energies productive, productively, they, they tend to use them unproductively. And so the kinds of problems you're seeing in Europe where, you know, in Greece there's this 60% youth unemployment rate. Right. That's the kind of thing where it would not be a surprise that you get explosive 
kinds of behavior. The second one is that uh, there are a, lot of, a number of studies that show that when there is um, inequality that is ethnic-based, when you have large groups of people who are poor of a particular group, mm -hmm. so it's not a, across the board, it has a, uh, an ethnic dimension, a racial dimension, that tends to be particularly destructive. Mm -hmm. And, and in, at least you know, looking across countries, those countries where the, you have that kind of division are more likely to be in, uh, find themselves engaged in civil strife or, or one kind of dysfunctional as behavior or another. So that sort of gives rise to a, a bigger question here, which is, do you think more equal societies are happier societies? Because there are divergent <laughs> studies about this, right? Income inequality seems like a bad thing, but unequal societies are not maybe necessarily happier societies. I guess I, I would like all three of your thoughts on that. Thomas, if you want to start. Uh, you know, it's a matter of degree. You know, if you have a complete equality uh, in poverty, uh, you will not be very happy. So you probably need... Uh, <laughs> you know, you need, you need... So, you know, China uh, 30 years ago uh, or 40, 35 years ago was probably quite equal, but equal with, uh, you know, a lot of poverty that was not particularly good. So some level of inequality, you know, can be necessary to put incentives on people so that's, which sometimes just correspond to different life choices, sometimes correspond to pure incentives. So some level of inequality can be justified. Now the problem is that very often we use this kind of argument to justify uh, inequality right. levels which can absolutely not be justified like this and which are bad. Uh, for growth and which are bad for uh, for social welfare and, and happiness and you know I think the level of inequality uh, in the U.S. right now is very difficult to justify on the, on the basis of uh, you know incentives or growth consideration or, or uh, and, and and it is the same actually probably in China now where now uh, you know at uh, 30 years ago they didn't want to become like the Soviet Union so they liberalized their economy which was probably a very smart decision but now they should be afraid uh, you know, not to become like uh, post-Soviet Russia with uh, oligarchs uh, taking the money and, and going to other countries and leaving off uh, dividends uh, out of their country. And, and uh, so, you know, there's some, some level of, uh, of inequality that can be tolerated. There's a lot of evidence that you can become very rich and very happy with moderate inequality. <laughs> like in Northern Europe, you know, in, yeah. in Sweden, Norway or, or, is, no, is, is, Sweden or Norway or Denmark, you know, you have moderate inequality. But you still need sunlight, which and, is why and they're screwed. Are, <laughs> <laughs> no, they're rich enough to afford to fly to uh, <laughs> right. the Mediterranean. Turks and Caicos. Yeah. No, there are still things missing over there, but, but it's, uh, you know, there is evidence that we don't need extreme inequality. To yeah. And I guess I would also focus, not, you know, you talk about happiness and the average happiness. I'd, I'd worry a little bit much more on what you might call the deprivation. Mm -hmm. The people at the bottom uh, are not happy when you have a lot of inequality, you know, and, and, and they're not able to make the ends meet. They're, and justifiably unhappy, justifiably uh, uh, we should be concerned. So to me, th that, those kinds of extremes in, of inequality really are uh, bad for society and very bad for the people. Hey, I'm going to give something subjective here. I think that the, at least what strikes me, uh, I mean, the, the raw deprivation that, that's so common in the United States is, is, is the main thing. But there's also something that the rat race nature of what we've created, which is intimately tied in with inequality, yeah. that I, you talk to young people and, and they all, all of the ones I know seem to have this sense that they're almost like they just, they've just joined the Marines. And it's like the look to the man to your left, look to the man to your right, only one of you three is gonna make it yeah. through. Yeah. That's, the, that's the way life is for a 20 something American now. And that is clo closely tied to the sense that we have extreme inequality. And if you don't make it into those upper tiers, you have, well, um, I mean, uh, you won't yeah. have health care. I mean, you won't have, you won't have the, even the essentials of life. It's sort of like the rungs of the ladder are much further apart, yeah. and if you fall down, you really fall a long way. And this is not just a question of, you know, you might say perceived happiness, what you did in a survey. Uh, one of the remarkable things about the United States is that our life expectancy is lower than in other countries of comparable income. 
and our overall health. And part of the explanation is that we don't have good uh, health insurance. Health <laughs> and, but the interesting thing is it turns out that even among people with just as good health insurance with just as good income, uh, the state, health is not as good. Life expectancy is not as good as in the United States. And one of the hypotheses about that is life is very stressful. Yeah. And yeah. stress is not good. Tell me about it. I'm up here on stage <laughs> with you guys. Life is <laughs> stressful. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I do want to ask specifically, Paul, in, in terms of some of the narrative that's out there. Hillary Clinton may be running for president. Patricia Arquette has been talking about wage equality, gender equality, the importance of it. Uh, I think that there was a study that fewer large companies are run by women than by men named John or men named David. Right. <laughs> Which to me tells me there are not a lot of large companies run by women. And I, and I guess I wonder from an economics point of view, how, it, I mean, obviously we want to say we, we, we have gender parity in terms of wages, right? That's like a good thing for us to say. But in terms of, I mean, talk to me about that in, ter in, in economic terms. How important is that? Well, it's, it's, a, it, it's a huge waste of, of, of potential. I mean, presumably, there are, as the same fraction of women are, are, have, have the talents to actually run a company well as, as men. And so by, by excluding, you know, I, I actually have a, a a vague sense that if you wanted to invest in companies, you want to um, choose companies where the CEOs don't look the part. You know, if there's a tall, silver-haired guy with a, uh, um, th then then he probably got there on his looks, and he probably is an idiot. Uh, and uh, <laughs> um, and and in, and in a certain sense, the fact that the guy is male, that it's a guy, is telling you that they probably have somewhat excluded people because they just are the wrong gender. And no, I mean that's just a. Uh, I, I think you know, we, we are a more equal society in that respect than we used to be, and obviously we've benefited from that enormously, and we've stopped a long ways short of it. It's a, it, it's a remarkable thing. And it also gets back to Joe's point about markets aren't all that, right? Because right. you, will, you will find economists who say, well, if, the, if women were really just as good as men, then they, they'd be paid the same wages and they'd be offered the same opportunities because the free, the invisible hand of the marketplace, and no, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, in um, BLS's 13 industry categories, do. women make less than men in every single one. Men have been entering traditionally female-dominated sectors during the recovery period and earn more than women even in female-dominated jobs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the point that Paul uh, just made is, I think, really a, part of, a, a key point. And it's related to the point we were talking about before about Walmart being able to raise its wage without any real consequence. The point is that it's not just abstract market forces. There are social forces going on. There are market power, exploitation, discrimination. And that's where, you know, the, the fact that that's the case is a, uh, has a one hopeful element to it, that if we adopted policies, we could change that. It's not going to happen on its own. Those kinds of things have been perpetuated for a very long time, but it's actually the case that if we eliminated that kind of discrimination, the other, we would actually have a better performing economy. So it's, it, we could have more equality and a better performing economy. It's been hard to get that message through. Mm -hmm. um, I know we have um, questions from the audience coming at some point, but before we get to them, I want to sort of ask you guys, oh, and there are some of the questions. Um, I want to, we've spent a long time talking about the things that are wrong <laughs> in the world. And I would like to know from each one of you, where you see the bright spots? What is something, what, where is the good news? Thomas, <laughs> I'll, I'll start with you. Well, you know, I'm not particularly uh, pessimistic. You know, I, I see lots of uh, lots of good news. You know, I, if you take a very long run perspective, like, you know, we are talking about the problem of Europe today. But Europe is a, a much more prosperous and also a much more equal place today than what it was. Uh, a century ago, uh, when Europe was extremely unequal, uh, more unequal than the US, 
and today US is uh, much more unequal than Europe. So you know things change and different choices of policies and institutions can, can, can make things change. And also in the emerging world, uh, you know, there are lots of positive evolution uh, uh, going on. Uh, you know, I, I believe in, in uh, you know, that globalization can uh, help to reduce uh, poverty in the world. Assuming we don't expect everything from the market and we adopt the policies that can make uh, uh, globalization benefit to broader groups of the population. And sometimes government do it. You know, in, in, in Brazil, uh, during the past 15 years, uh, there were policies that were adopted, uh, including increasing the minimum wage, uh, uh, investment in, uh, in uh, public education, which allowed for reduction of inequality together with uh, quite high growth. You know, they start from a level of inequality which is extremely high in Brazil historically. This is a country where, you know, one third of the population was in slavery uh, 120 years ago. So, you know, they, there's a, you know, each country has its own complicated history with, uh, with inequality, but there are, uh, yes, there are bright spots, uh, uh, you know, uh, poverty in China was much higher uh, 30 years ago than it is today. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I, you know, I think it's not our job is not to say uh, that things are always uh, worse and that inequality is always rising. You know, this is not the way I view my, uh, my, my, my job. You know, I think there are uh, lots of opportunities which are sometimes taken by government and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, not, not taken so much uh, as, as they should. Okay, but the, I guess there are three things I mentioned very briefly. One. Uh, uh, Thomas just mentioned, which is uh, not just Brazil, but uh, several countries in Latin America have uh, been experiencing a reduction in inequality. And that's partly because inequality in those countries had grown to such a high level that they couldn't continue to ignore it. They put in place policies that actually were directed at reducing inequality, and they worked. So that's, you know, it shows that, that when there's a political will, you can actually make significant progress in a relatively short time. The second one uh, is sort of looking at it from a global point of view. Uh, what happened from 1820 to, say, 1980 was that large parts of the world fell way behind. Um, India and China that have close to 50% of the population used to have close to 50% of the global GDP, and it went down to 8%. Uh, and now there those, the income of those countries are going up. Uh, 500 pe million people moved out of poverty in China. Uh, so so it, it, th that th there have been enormous number of people who really benefited, uh, seen their incomes grow in the last 50 years, just not in America. Uh, <laughs> but that, elsewhere. And, and the third point is the fact that we're having this discussion here today <laughs> that the issue of inequality has finally yeah. uh, been raised to the point where even some of the Republican candidate, candidates are talking about it. Maybe they want to increase it, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but at least they're talking about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poverty yeah. warrior has so, a different meaning, perhaps, in some yeah, circles. Yeah, um, just to, so I'm, I'm actually, um, so I'm moving uh, from, from Princeton to, to CUNY Grad Center, and particularly with the, the, the Luxembourg Income Study Group, who sp study income inequality, and they've been doing it for, for, for decades, but have seen a tremendous upsurge in interest. I mean, it has become, so the, these are people who, who have a, you know, their, their finger on the pulse, and, and the, the, the issue of inequality really has, uh, Come, come to the fore, which is, is hopeful. That's how, how you start to finally build a consensus to do something about it. I also want to actually, just coming back to the, to the um, issue of, of gender inequality and, and, and such things, um, while it's still terrible and enormous gaps and in inequality of treatment, um, in many ways, let me put it this way, if, if you go back to when America was truly a middle class society in, in the 60s, um, there was a we lost a lot of good things when that went away. On the other hand, there was a lot of raw racism, raw sexism, raw prejudice. That is, and, and we have become, in many ways, a vastly more tolerant, uh, accepting society. You watch something like, uh, I mean, go, I, I've studied some of these polls. When, when Reagan was elected, 
a, a plurality of Americans uh, were opposed to interracial marriage. Yeah. That we've changed a lot in those times. And think, think about how, you know, in the 2004 election, to some extent, was decided on, on the issue of gay marriage. As I say, you know, Bush ran as, a, as America's defender against gay married terrorists. And then, uh, um, and here we are just, you know, 11 years later, and all of a sudden that's become a widely accepted thing. So these are, that doesn't excuse this spectacular, uh, you know, inequality, the, the growth of plutocracy, the, the oligarchy, what I think uh, Tomai has, has successfully convinced me is, is the high likelihood that it becomes increasingly a hereditary elite. Um, but, but it does say that there are good things as well. And, and I think those things continue. And maybe, eventually, we, we finally do get tackle these, these, the, the problem of, of income inequality as well. We just need will and grace to take on income inequality. Well, I'm kidding, yes. that's off the air. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, questions from the audience. This is from Sonia Forgo. Um, I'll, start, I'll start with you, Paul. Uh, what are the policy changes you would like to see in the next five years to best address income inequality? Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is like the That wish I'd like list. to see or that I think has to have a chance of what actually happening. What like to see. You'd like to right. see. No. High in the sky or <coughs> as realistic as you want? No, well, I mean, we actually have a pretty good idea of a menu of stuff that would, that would make a big difference. And would, uh, some of it is aftermarket, uh, is higher taxes, uh, you know, higher taxes on, uh, particularly on capital income, close, you know, shut, and we can go after some of those uh, international tax havens, but, and, and more aid, <coughs> uh, of course, you know, make, get the Affordable Care Act actually working nationwide, and, and, but more aid, especially for, for children. Um, some of it is pre-market, and here's what we've just seen. The Walmart example I find tremendously encouraging. It's, it's saying that it doesn't take very much to push uh, large private sector employers who are paying uh, uh, criminally low wages into paying a lot, of, a lot more. And so all it would take would be raise the minimum wage, make... Um, uh, to, the, the, the legal policy balance has been shifted so overwhelmingly against unionization that actually just moving it back somewhere towards neutral, I think, would be, make a big difference. Um, would that, you know, that's, we don't know how much all that would do, but I don't think it's actually very hard to think of a, a set of, of pretty simple policies, everything from women wages, card check, uh, um, more progressive taxation, more aid that would, you know, th these are all things that I think in the euphoria after the 2008 election, many of us thought might be about to happen. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe now it doesn't happen until Chelsea's second term. Or <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but it's not hard. I think that one of the things we're learning is it's actually technically not that hard to do a lot about inequality. Um. Yeah, well, I, uh, uh, the last chapter of my book, The Price of Inequality, actually is devoted to this. So, so you, uh, if you want the whole list, uh, you should buy just, the book. Just, just and, a couple. <laughs> right. Just and, a couple. <laughs> but I, I think the, the big distinction I would make is between there are a number of policies that sort of tweak at the edge or are important but don't address the underlying structure. So, and, and then there are real policies that try to get at not just the symptoms, you know, and a symptom is like the wage being very low at the bottom, that's a symptom, but looking at what are the forces giving rise to, to this. So, for instance, uh, what, what Paul just mentioned, stronger unions would make a difference in terms of changing the bargaining yeah. power. Uh, laws that dig something about, you know, we, part of our tax law almost encouraged uh, CEO bonuses, uh, stock options. And if we just got rid of that, got more transparency on that, I think that would probably, you know, say and pay that, that you would think that people who work for you, you ought to have a say in their pay. Yeah. But uh, the shareholders have no say in the pay who are, uh, of the people who are supposed to work for them. You know, those are kinds of changes that might bring down the top, um, and uh, then finally, uh, not finally, but a, a really important part is obviously education. Yeah. Because we have a whole set of ways where we give transmission of advantage from one generation to another. And that's gotten worse. Um, the, 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 we spend more in our public education on the children of the rich than we do on the children of the poor. So 
there are lots of things like that that if we're going to do something about inequality, we have to break that transmission mechanism, which is making it hard for those at the bottom to make it, uh, make it up. Thomas? Right, no, in investment in public education, you know, I, I think there's a very strong uh, uh, theoretical discourse about meritocracy, equal opportunity, which is just uh, you know the, the gap with what's happening in the you know in the in the real life uh, in in this country is quite large. There's also a big gap in other countries, but in this country, you know, there's a graph that uh, Raj Shetty and Emmanuel says recently produced, where if you have the if you put the percentile rank uh, in the family income distribution and the probability to access higher education, you you go almost from zero to 100. So if you are in the bottom. 20% or bottom half of the family distribution of, of, uh, of income, you, you, you know, at the bottom, you have only a 20% chance to access higher education. If you have in the top 10%, you have almost a 90%, 100% chance to access higher education. And you have a straight line, basically, going from zero to 100, if you take the percentile rank in family uh, we, we uh, income some... and, and access to higher education. And if you take for very top schools, you know, very top universities, the av average income from the data we have, but there's actually too little transparency about that, the average income of the parents of Harvard undergrad right now corresponds to the average income of the top 2% of the U.S. distribution of family income. So that doesn't mean that nobody from below the top 2 <laughs> gets to Harvard, but this means something very precise, which is that the people from below the top two persons that go to Harvard are sufficiently few, right. and the people from the top two are sufficiently high up in the top two that the overall average is as if all students had been picked at random within the top two persons of the distribution. So you see the gap between this and the official discourse in terms of the very high mobility of American society and meritocratic feature, you know, it's, it's quite large. Well, the and, and so I think investing in, in, you know, public education and a more equal access to education, and this should be financed, of course, by making the top groups pay uh, more uh, tax. Let me, <laughs> let me just emphasize why that's so important. One of the reasons it's so important. Uh, you know, I, I described before how the median income uh, has been stagnating. Many, median income of, say, full-time male worker is below what it was 40 years ago. If you divide that into those who get a college education and those who don't, uh, those who have only a high school, their incomes have really plummeted. Uh, so it's not just stagnating, they're really plummeting. So those people at, at, at the bottom that Thomas described, the children have very little chance of getting college. That means the, their income prospects are really bad. Well, th this I actually just, <clears throat> let me just say, I, I'm a little concerned about where we're going here because all this is true, but education is not by itself the no, solution. solution. We, we, in fact, uh, incomes of college grads have been flat for 15 years in the United States. Uh, it, it's, it, no, the, it, it's, no, it's no longer the case that this is about college grads versus not. At this point, you know, uh, well, basically, uh, you know, high school teachers and hedge fund managers have similar levels of education, uh, but not similar uh, destinies in, in, in recent years. And, and, and so we, we need to understand that this is not, um, I, I mean, I think- It won't be fixed by education. In many ways, education is more about, I would say at this point, it's more about everyone having access to the opportunities. It's not clear how much the inequality of outcomes would be changed. It's more about any actual Well, I, you know, I, I think you're right in the very top part of the distribution where it's not education. You know, the, the, it's not, uh, you know, the, the, it's not the top one percent income earners. Uh, you know, they are not a lot more educated right. than the next two or three or five percent, as you were right. saying. So it's more, you know, top managerial compensation that has exploded, uh, the financial sector that has taken. So I, I agree with you that education is not going to solve this top part of inequality. But if you think of the, the bottom part, you know, the bottom 50% of the US uh, uh, workforce as compared to the next 40%, the next 10%, then I think the inequality in access to skills and education is a serious uh, 
a serious issue. Well, it's certainly a factor reducing social mobility. And that's a, what I was going to break in is we actually have some evidence that um, where, where students ha who took standardized tests in, in eighth grade have been tracked further and, and we can compare their ability, students' likelihood of completing college um, um, based upon their test scores and based upon the socioeconomic status of their families. And yep, rich, dumb kids are more likely to graduate from college than, right. than smart well, poor kids. <laughs> That's so, America today. But the, 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 this is the thing. I mean, whether it's education or whether it's fiscal policy, whether it's redistribution, that, that it comes from a policymaking class that is going to fundamentally change this, right? And the policymaking class tends to be the better educated and wealthier class. So I guess, you know, when you look at changing these systems, whichever system you want, I mean, how do you get the change agents in the systems? And I wonder, and Paul, I'll start with you, how much credence do you, I mean, how, how much import do you put on grassroots movements, like Occupy, for example, to, to change systems? Well, I think it, That's actually a question yeah. from the audience <laughs> that I paraphrase yeah. wildly. No, I, I think they can matter a lot, and I, they can matter by, not, not in itself. I mean, it was, not, it was never going to be the case that people were going to move up from Zuccotti Park and, right. and, and storm the bastions of Wall Street, but, it, was, but it, it actually did change the discussion. And, and in a way, it has not flipped back. The, the issues that were raised by Occupy have not gone out of the discussion. Um, I think it takes a, a mix of things. Uh, uh, I mean, part of, uh, I, gosh, I mean, I mean, forced into being the, the optimist and idealist here. But the, uh, <laughs> it's a bleak uh, crowd. Uh, but that, uh, well, it's true that, that, you know, the, that highly educated, privileged people have disproportionate political power in our system. They aren't all completely selfish. <laughs> Right. And, and people, and it, that uh, there are, I think, enough, so as we don't rely solely upon the goodwill of, of enlightened people who've had privilege, but, but there will be some of those, and there will be, uh, there can be popular movements, and there can be agitators who bring issues to the fore, and um, I think if you, had, if you tried to look at the balance of forces in America in the 1920s, you would have said, you know, no way this can possibly be reformed, and yet it was, and why, you know, it, it, it can happen again. It doesn't have to. Could be that 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 we remain stuck for a very long time, but but hopefully not. Thomas, what, in terms of Occupy, which is a global movement, not beyond Zuccotti Park, perhaps not as well covered in the American media, but how much stock do you put in the grassroots movements? No, I, I think this can play and this must play a very important role. Now, you know, Occupy Wall Street happened mostly in Wall Street rather than in uh, than in Brussels or in in, well, in Paris Hong Kong. or in Tokyo. Well, Hong Kong, it's, a, it's really a different movement. Here, it's, yeah. a, it's a movement about you know, political freedom and political democracy uh, in the Chinese context, and that's, of course, that's very, very important. But, I mean, if Occupy Wall Street happened more in Wall Street than in Brussels or Paris or Berlin or Tokyo, it's because the rise of the 1% you know, has been a lot stronger in Wall Street and in the U.S. than in Europe or in Japan. So, so uh, is, uh, you know, there are reasons for this, and in a way, it's, it's at least it's reassuring to see that there is some, uh, uh, you know, some awareness of that. You know, I think the, the democratization of, uh, of knowledge and the diffusion of uh, economic knowledge uh, can play uh, an important role, you know, I think. But then, you know, it's, uh, you know, we need uh, more and more uh, uh, citizens to, uh, you know, to be, uh, to be involved, to be informed. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the success of books on inequality, such as those uh, written by, uh, by, by Joe, Paul, or, or my, my own book, you know, shows that there is certainly a strong demand for, you know, uh, economic knowledge and, and, you know, many people, not only in the US, but in many other parts of the world, are tired to hear that this is too complicated for them, that they cannot understand economic issues, that you know, there's only one solution, only one policy, and, and many people are asking for, for more than that, and you know, I think this can, in the long run, uh, make a difference. Let me come back to the question of, of the role of civil society. And, and one, you know, I was very uh, uh, pessimistic about Europe, but one, Hopeful sign in Europe is the growth of these uh, of, of new groups like Palermo's in in in, in Spain, which are mm. saying the old parties are not a are, are not really addressing the problems of unemployment inequality, and right now it's it's the leading party in Spain with about 27 mm -hmm. percent uh, 
Uh, so, but I think that, that also raises an important point. Uh, I think in the end, it's going to have to be political action that's going to address these issues. And civil society can bring the issue to the fore, but the real challenge will be to try to get those ideas into the political process. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, I'm not so optimistic. Um, and it's, it, in Europe, it's partly because of the really collapse of the, of the, the real failure of the old parties. And we haven't yet gotten to that stage. Yet. Yeah, I, I <laughs> yeah. noticed the yet in that yeah, sentence. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go to you, Tomas, first on this. With the current status quo, socioeconomically speaking, where do you see the future of the wealthy nations in the Gulf, such as Saudi Arabia? <laughs> Where do I see the future? Where do you see the future of the wealthy nations in the Gulf, such but as Saudi heavens. Arabia? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. You know, I think the, 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 the you know, uh, the frontiers, <laughs> the frontiers in this part of the world, you know, are, are uh, largely arbitrary, and you know, they were drawn at some point in time, and. Uh, it looks as if some of them will be withdrawn. I mean, uh, you know, but I don't know how, you know, uh, it's, uh, so that's, uh, that's, I don't know if that's part of the question, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think the, the, the inequality of resources in this part of the world is just uh, in, impossible to, to justify. You know, there, there are uh, uh, countries with, uh, with very large population with very little resources and, and countries with very small population with lots of resources, they don't know what to do with it. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I prefer peaceful redistribution, but sometimes <laughs> uh, redistribution takes other, uh, other forms. Indeed. Um, Paul, what is your opinion of disruptive digital currencies such as Bitcoin? Do they in any way wow. refute the idea that a currency must be backed by a government? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, I mean, actually at this point, uh, uh, Bitcoin is not looking too good. Uh, and uh, uh, the, I, I mean, there... Money is a is a is a pretty amazing thing, right? That for the most part, why do, why does a why does a piece of green paper with a, a dead president have value? And it's because other people think it has value and it circulates. And we like, however, there is an anchor for our dollar bills, which is not gold. It is the fact that you can use to pay taxes. And then you have somebody try and create Bitcoin, which is there's nothing in the end. It's supposed to be purely self-fulfilling prophecy, purely levitating on, on itself, um, which is not impossible, but it's kind of unlikely. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I think, I think a lot of what has happened, Bitcoin looks like, like a, it really is a, a, a bubble in, in, in multiple senses. It's, it's a little bit of, it's, it's a tech, apparently it's a technically sweet solution to a problem, but it's not clear that that problem is one that, that has much economic relevance, uh, certainly not a reason to hold that currency. Um, it is a, uh, a, there's a lot of libertarian ideology uh, about it. Yes. And, uh, and, you know, I think, so people were looking for something and, and they bought into it and literally bought, literally bought into it for a while, but it's now it's collapsed quite a way. So no, the idea that, that there's something fundamental, I mean, if, you, if you're looking for the idea that, that a currency doesn't really have to be something physical, it can be something that's virtual, that's the system we already have. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, and if you want it to be, uh, yeah. I want a way to make payments um, electronically, that's, you know, credit cards. I mean, so exactly what it is that this <laughs> thing is supposed to be doing that we don't already mostly do. I mean, there are technical differences, but pretty wild. I mean, yeah, we, we already have an amazingly abstract, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the um, sorry, I'm going on too much, but, you know, the monetary base, we have... Uh, you know, $4 trillion now in monetary base, and it consists of nothing but ones and zeros. I mean, so what, you know, it's the idea that now, oh, I've got this brilliant new thing, it's gonna be right, digital, the we're already there, you know, yeah. <clears throat> um, Professor Stiglitz, economically speaking, what should the US or Europe do vis-a-vis -vis China to ensure growth for all? <laughs> uh, well, in terms of China, 
Uh, Ick's been doing actually quite well on its own. Uh, <laughs> Ick's been growing you know, for, for 30 years after they began the transition to a market economy. They grew at, at an average rate of 10%. It wasn't fully shared prosperity. The Gini coefficient, the measure of inequality, when they began was very low. And uh, they achieved in 30 years the level of inequality that it took us a long time to <laughs> so, so, so they uh, so they now their Gini coefficient now is comparable to the United States. But at the same time, they moved, as I mentioned before, 500 million people out of poverty. You know, that it, it was the most successful uh, anti-poverty program. Uh, they're likely to go, grow more slowly, and uh, but even if they're growing at seven or even six percent, that's higher than economists even you know really thought was possible uh, forty years ago. You know, forty years ago it would be a five percent would be a phenomenal rate. So I, I think China is is. Uh, uh, doing quite well. The real problem is the United States and Europe. Yeah. And, and for Europe, uh, uh, my view, Europe has very talented people, as we've seen, <laughs> but I mean, it actually has a lot of it, it, good institutions, all the things uh, that you would have thought would have made for strong growth, except for two things. Uh, the oh. euro was a <laughs> mistake and the institutions around that that would make it work, and a set of policies and the ideas that we talked about in the beginning that really have been strangling the euro. So for me, for, the Europe, to, for Europe to start to grow, it has nothing to do with China. For Europe to start to grow is really for it to, to uh, uh, fix the problem of the euro. And, and to solve the problem of the, of the austerity fanatics in Germany, particularly. So that's a, uh, that's a, and for the United States, I don't, again, I don't think it's the issue of China um, that, that is really the, the key issue. The case for the issues in the United States are really uh, what the kinds of issues that we've been talking about today. Uh, the really the issues of of how, how do we uh, stimulate our economy more, invest more, um, and make sure that the again the gr the growth that we have is more equally shared. And I think that will be a virtuous cycle. So that if we had it more ver equally shared, demand would be stronger, the economy would be growing. We have to wrap it up, but I can't. We can't wrap it up without getting your thoughts on. <laughs> On, on the Germans, the Europeans, and the Chinese. Well, and China, yeah, you know. Not I, that the Germans aren't Europeans, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. They have a special special role of import in, in, in Europe right now. You know, I, I think the European institutions are even more uh, dysfunctional than American federal institutions, which, uh, you know, I don't know if this is good news, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's certainly a fact. Uh, but, you know, I think Chinese institutions maybe are even more dysfunctional than the <laughs> European institutions, you know, in the sense that, you know, this is a country that will have to do major reforms in terms of uh, democracy and also transparency on economic and financial issues. You know, this is the only country where, you know, you have an income tax in China, but there's no income tax statistic of any sort. You know, it's not, impos it's not even possible to know how much money was collected by income brackets the previous year. And, you know, I, I have studied many countries and, I, you know, I've never seen that. You know, this is, so, you know, they say they want to fight corruption right now. But, you know, the way, the way they do it, uh, which is a little bit the Russian way, you know, they put, they put just, a few which people is a in jail. Strange way to combat corruption. Yes. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, they put a few people in jail from time to time, which is what Putin did. Uh, so they do the same in China. But you know, I think it would be a lot more efficient to have a more democratic and more transparent uh, approach to the economy and to the tax system. For instance, you know, if they were to publish. Uh, at the local level, how many uh, taxpayers by income bracket, including for very high income brackets. You know, in many cases, we will realize that the law and the tax system is not really being applied the way it should, and it will allow, you know, the, the uh, uh, popular uh, groups and, and grassroots groups also to use this information to complain 
about the way the government is working, the tax system is working. So these are very serious issues that they will have to address. And if we want to, on the international arena, you know, when we think of fighting tax havens and we think of minimal tax on large multinational corporations, we need to bring China in that game. You know, we are not going to solve this thing just between, you know, the US and the European Union. You know, China has to play a role and, you know, the, the lack of transparency in the Hong Kong financial system is a serious issue. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I think we, 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 we have to look at all these different uh, regions and parts of the world together if we want to solve that kind of, of problem. I want to say one more thing about lack of transparency. Um, the air in Beijing and Shanghai, <laughs> yeah. China could very well be the first economy to, to really stumble out of, to strangle itself on environmental problems. So. True. True words were not spoken. Well, there are many true words tonight. I can say that I, I, we end this evening perhaps more optimistic, certainly more fired up. It's been wonderful and enlightening to have the conversation with three geniuses. Thomas Pickett and Joseph Sigmund. Thank you guys. Thank you guys.